Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for Beyond the Audiogram, Diagnostic and Verification Tools to Improve Hearing Aid and Cochlear Implant Fittings. Um, very happy to uh, welcome Brad and Grail, who is not presented in quite some time, uh, and David and Draghi, both of them from the Long Beach um, VA. Um, and also I want to thank, before we get started, I want to thank um, Tony Trujillo from um, Alternative Communication Services for providing CART tonight. Thanks so much, Tony. Appreciate it. And um, I'm going to go ahead and let uh, you get started, Brad. I know that you have um, a lot of material to cover. Everybody should have captions um, rolling, so I think we're all set. And I'll let you go ahead and get started. I'll turn over the mouse to you now. Okay. Thank you again. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, welcome, and thanks for having us. Um, this slide that you see now, the disclaimer, uh, Dr. Andraghi and I both work for the VA. However, tonight we're participating in HLAA as private citizens. And uh, we just want to make it clear that while some veterans may be watching this, and we hope they are, um, our presentation here is, again, as private citizens, we're happy to see veterans, but we're not able to see private citizens. And so anything that we talk about is um, just sort of general information, not specific to any services or benefits that may be available through the Veterans Administration or the federal government. So now that we got all that lawyer stuff out of the way, let us get rolling here. If I can get my mouse, come on. There we go. All right, so people with hearing loss, you all are familiar with hearing loss because you're members of HLAA, which is really the best thing that you can do. Um, equally as important as having a good hearing healthcare team. Um, but one of the things that Dr. Andraghi and I notice a lot is that we tend to measure how much sound you can hear, but we don't always measure the quality of that sound. We don't always measure um, what the hearing devices can do with that sound. And so 10 or 15 years ago, we basically could make sounds louder and that was about it. Now we have in hearing aids as well as cochlear implants, some really good technology to not only make sounds loud enough for you to hear, which is what we call audibility, but also to shape that sound in very specific ways so that you can understand it to the best of your ability. And also so that we can help you understand speech when there's other things going on. So the, the point of tonight's talk is to give you some just or hearing aid specialist um, to, to use some tools that they already have to hopefully get a better handle on not only the amount of sound you can hear, but how can we best put that sound into your auditory system so that you can get the best quality of life from that sound. Okay, so within uh, the typical toolbox that we have, we have some tools that give us a better real world validation. Now, Dr. Andreghi happens to be sitting in one of our sound treated booths at the Long Beach VA. And if you've had hearing loss for any amount of time, you've spent a lot of time in one of these big metal boxes. And the one thing that's the, that's the same about all of these metal boxes is they have absolutely nothing to do with the real world. They're not like your living room. They're not like your Starbucks. They're not like anything other than a big sound treated room. So if we can get some way to look at your experience with hearing outside of that box, we might do better. We also want to look at helping you understand more about how well you understand or may not understand words. There's some tools that we can help people who have particularly high pitch hearing loss 
and we can also help out with noise reduction of a couple of different kinds. So we're going to talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail. Whoops. All right, so the first one is this thing called the AFAB. A-P-H-A-B is an abbreviation for the abbreviated profile of hearing aid benefit. And it was developed a long time ago, uh, in 1995 in fact, um, as a joint project between the Memphis VA and the University of Memphis. And what's really nice about it is it's built in to the software that your hearing care professional uses to fit your hearing aids. It's called NOAA. It's very quick and easy to, to complete. And it allows your hearing care professional to look at how well you're doing in different settings, but also how well you do compared to other people similar to you. And if we change something like a new hearing aid or a different cochlear implant strategy, we can measure the improvement or the change. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the AFAB. This is what the AFAB screen in the NOAA software looks like. And what you're asked to do is to think about a typical environment with your hearing aids, or if you don't have hearing aids yet, without your hearing aids, and answer how often the following statements are true. So the first one, when I am in a crowded grocery store, talking with the cashier, I can follow the conversation. If you never have difficulty in that situation, then that would be true, always true, or almost always true. But if you're guessing most of the time when you're in that crowded grocery store, maybe that's only true occasionally or seldom. So with this tool, in a very short period of time, your hearing care professional can get a good picture of how you're having difficulty in different situations. Now, Dr. Andreghi is quite a bit younger than I am. You can tell by all that black hair he has as opposed to all the no hair that I have. Um, but since he's kind of uh, newer in the field, I'd like him to just talk a little bit about how he's seen the benefits of AFAB coming in and, and looking at um, his patients at the VA. So a little bit of background on myself. Thank you, Dr. Ingrao. I am only a couple years out of school, and throughout the schooling, we really get taught all of these different verification tools you can use, but not necessarily everyone uses them in practice, because unfortunately in the private world, if a hearing aid is working or if it's not, that's not unfortunately necessarily sometimes the biggest concern for some clinicians. So what I found is with our population especially, using this type of questionnaire and some other tools we have at our disposal, but specifically this questionnaire, it takes very small amount of time. Um, speaking too fast, got it. It takes very small amounts of time to run through and accomplish and complete the questionnaire. But what it tells and what the information it gives the clinician is, is almost invaluable. So there are some other slides coming up and we'll show you exactly what essentially information it can give your clinician. But what this is trying to do is saying, yes, I have a hearing loss and these are where the frequencies I need a little bit more help with. But more importantly, this is how well the hearing aids are helping me in the real world. And that helps me, the clinician or the individual doing the programming currently, how I can improve and change and modify a bunch of different things with the actual processing self of either the hearing aid or the implant. And it really can guide the further and upcoming appointments. And we can track and chart benefit in our what we're doing. Is that helping? Or are you not doing maybe as well as you used to? So it, it really is invaluable. The next couple of slides will really show you in a real world case scenario, how this can improve the day-to-day -day situations. Great, thanks. So this again 
it's involved. The other thing that we do with a, with a typical hearing test, you know, we put the earphones on and you have the little button and your audiologist presses a button and you hear beep, 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 and you press the button and say, I hear it. The second part of the hearing test is usually some amount of word understanding testing. And it's pretty typical to do one ear and then do the other ear. And this is, a, so in this slide, we see a typical hearing test speech audiometry result, 44% in the right ear and 32% in the left ear. Not very good. But here's an interesting thing. If you simply do one more list and we look at both ears together, this gives us a lot of information. This person almost hears twice as well, twice as accurately, when both ears are used together. This is really important because we're born with two ears most of the time, and we use two hearing aids or two implants or one of each. And this is really good information for us to say, you really benefit from this binaural fusion, we call it. So it takes another 45 seconds or so to do a list, but it's really helpful because there are times when one ear is better than the other for word understanding. And it's really important when your audiologist or hearing care professional is setting up your equipment to know what is the interaction between your two ears. Hearing aids and cochlear implants nowadays are in fact interacting with each other to help us better find the speech and to better understand. So it's really critical that you know how well do you hear with both ears. So ask your uh, hearing care professional, hey, when you do that word testing, can you do one ear and the other ear and then do both ears together? And that's very helpful. Now, the other thing that can be helpful is the second one. We can do testing with our hearing aids or our cochlear implants on and do the same test. Now, people who have cochlear implants are quite used to this kind of testing, but it's pretty atypical in the hearing aid world. We're starting to do more and more of this in Long Beach to determine whether or not we will evaluate somebody for a cochlear implant or when we do that evaluation. And so in this example here, the last two lines are actually both ears together. SF stands for sound field. So the person's wearing their hearing aids and you can see that by making some changes to the hearing aid, we were able to take them from 56% to 72%. So going all the way back, the right ear by itself, without a hearing aid, 44%. With both ears together, without a hearing aid, 64%. And with the hearing aid set appropriately, 72%. Now, here's an interesting thing. The line just above that, that would be the hearing aids that we would consider not quite fit right yet, because you're actually hearing worse with the hearing aids than you were without the hearing aids. So this kind of testing gives you and your hearing care professional much more valuable information about how your whole system works together. All right, the last slide hinted at this, but there's a tool that's been available for many years called frequency lowering is a general term, frequency compression, they also call it. And what it does is it takes the high pitches that most people with hearing loss don't hear very well, and it moves them into an area where their ear is in better shape. It takes some time for your brain to get used to this. And some people may remember an older hearing aid called the IMPACT or the AVR. That was one of the early frequency lowering devices. Now, all of the major manufacturers have frequency lowering. So if you have a hearing loss that is very poor in the high pitches and your word understanding is not very good, frequency lowering may be one of those things that can help you. And if you do this sound field 
aided word testing with your audiologist or hearing care professional, they can turn it on and turn it off and see, and in this particular case, the person went from 56% to 72% by just changing this little setting. That's a very big improvement. Dr. Grout, also if I would add, what I have started doing with our patients in Long Beach when we're talking about frequency lowering, as you probably are know, you guys all know, the VA in general, 95% of our hearing losses are that high frequency hearing loss because previous noise exposure, which means you can hear, but you have a hard time understanding. What this graph and what this slide is really showing is with some of these front end processing things in the hearing aid, by changing some of those high pitches, yes, it will make pots and pans, forks and knives, road noise sound different. But if you have an audiologist or you can even take it home with you and test it in the real world, the difference in sound quality potentially will correlate to better speech understanding. And I use that as kind of a counseling tool up front when I activate these hearing aids or if we go from a manufacturer who doesn't have this to a manufacturer who does, I tell my guys and gals, you are going to hear things differently. That's okay. Based on these speech scores we found, we are expecting you to do better in the real world. So just because it sounds maybe a little tinier or sharper, if it's correlating to speech understanding, that's ultimately a good thing. Right, very good. So the next thing that, whoops, let's go back one. The next thing that I think we often overlook these days is a dedicated program for noise reduction. Back in the old days, you had a hearing aid with a switch on it, and the switch would activate a, a directional microphone. And so if you walked into a noisy environment, and you flip this switch, it would focus the hearing aids to the front by turning off the microphone in the back. Current hearing devices, both cochlear implants and hearing aids, have much more sophisticated abilities to automatically adjust the microphones. Now, um, a lot of marketing and a lot of uh, hearing care professionals feel that, hey, this really is all you need. You don't really need any more than that automatic. And that may be correct. However, the reality is that many people do need more noise reduction capabilities and more ability to deal with reverberation. And so a dedicated noise reduction program can accommodate for more severe loss, some slower processing as we get older, some attention, uh, issues. Some people have a hard time focusing if the hearing aids are moving around. And some people just prefer to say, look, I want to talk to this person and I really don't want to hear what's going on over here. This is going to come in through the loop. That's going to reduce the effect of the background noise and you'll get a cleaner signal. So the noise reduction program does the same thing, but rather than using the telecoil, it uses the microphones on the devices. And oftentimes we wanna make things convenient for you all and not having to push a button is a convenience. And, I, and, I, and we typically will say, look, 85, 90% of the time, if the noise is not very loud and the environment is not very uh, dynamic, this may be all you need. However, I'd rather have you have this tool and not need it than need it and not have it. So ask for a dedicated noise reduction program. Ask for some practice in the office. How do I turn on or activate my programs? Sometimes it's a button on your hearing aid. Oftentimes now it's your iPhone. You can push a button on your iPhone. You can get a remote control. You can have a Bluetooth streamer with buttons. So ask for these programs and try them out. And you may find certain situations that you have avoided in the past, you can now have more success in because you have more predictable control over what's going on around you compared to the speed. Each 
LAA hearing loss is loud sudden sounds like if I clap my hands or somebody slams a door or drops a plate, they really make you go, yikes. And we've typically called that recruitment and it's a little bit of a misnomer. Recruitment is a broader term for an abnormally rapid growth of the perception of loudness above our threshold. However, this very specific impulse noise some people are very sensitive to that kind of noise more so than other loud sounds. And so a lot of hearing aids also now have that ability. Well, what's nice is that AFAB that we talked about earlier actually has a specific category for that. And so when we see veterans, we often see this noise, impulse noise problem, and it shows up in that tool, the AFAB. We can then use that information to set a particular type of noise control in the hearing device that helps smooth out some of those jumpy sounds without taking away from the speech. And then six or eight weeks later, we can do that AFAB again, and we can see that the difficulty has been resolved. If it hasn't, then we can go and we can manipulate that control even more. And that's available in both hearing aids, and cochlear implants. All right, so we'd like to introduce you now to uh, a, a, a person that we see at the Long Beach VA. This is a 75-year-old veteran. He's used hearing aids since 2004. On the right-hand side, we see his audiogram, and if you're a little bit familiar with how to read an audiogram, the blue line is his left ear, the red line is his right ear. From your left to right, it's low pitch to high pitch. From the top to the bottom, it's quiet to loud. And above his lines is where speech happens. So he really doesn't hear speech much at all without his hearing aids. And if we look at his word understanding, the speech recognition, we see that he only gets 16% in the right ear and only 24% in the left ear. So this is your typical hearing test. Now it tells us a little bit, but it really doesn't tell us a lot. So we did a little bit more testing with him and we find that he's really having a lot of trouble in a lot of places. So over here on the left-hand side, is the results of that AFAB questionnaire. The EC section stands for Ease of Communication. That is how much difficulty, what percentage of the time does this veteran have difficulty understanding in a quiet room? RV stands for reverberant. That's like a big high ceiling or a church or some auditorium. BN stands for background noise, self-explanatory, and AV, that's that aversiveness, that loud sudden sound. So we see that he has a lot of difficulty. 60% of the time, he's not understanding well. Now this is with a pair of hearing aids, by the way. He's already wearing hearing aids. 80% of the time he has difficulty in background noise and reverberation with his hearing aids. And he's still bothered by loud sudden sounds about 35% of the time. Another nice thing about that AFAB I mentioned earlier was we can compare your results against other similar people. So if we consider, if we compare these results against other people who wear hearing aids similar to this veteran, he has more trouble in quiet than 85% of people who wear hearing aids. He has more trouble in reverberation and background noise than 95% of people, and he has more trouble with aversiveness than 50%. When we looked at his original hearing aid fitting that he came in with, this frequency lowering is the gray bar on the right-hand side of these two graphs. That shows where the manufacturer recommends 
we set that frequency lowering. And he only had an automatic program. He didn't have any telecoil and he didn't have any noise reduction program. So given this hearing aid fitting, just a typical out of the box hearing aid fitting, he still has more trouble than almost everybody that he meets who has hearing aids. So this person has not gotten a good hearing aid solution yet. So in comes Dr. Andreghi, who's going to save the day by doing a little bit more for this guy. So what that previous graph is also showing is this is a typical hearing aid patient, probably like some of you guys, going to your audiologist and saying, I'm just really not doing well. Sometimes it's hard to specifically point out exact situations that you're not doing well. But what that questionnaire does is give a wide range of examples of hypothetical situations. And that helps the audiologist decide, oh yeah, despite the hearing aid set appropriately based on real ear, despite having the best you know, technology out there, it's still showing us empirical data saying this gentleman is still not doing well. So what we did in this case, we activated and more importantly, we made a little bit more aggressive change in the frequency lowering aspect of the hearing aid. This inherently will, won't help the individual understand speech, but it will at least give us the best chance at giving the ear and more importantly the brain an envelope or information that is digestible. So again, this hearing aid will sound different, but whenever we start testing with this frequency lowering more aggressively than what the manufacturer says it should be at, we can start identifying and showing, yes, we are seeing improvement in all of these different situations. So the frequency lowering was one. We added, I believe, a directional program, which is again, an environmental mode, specifically to be used in situations where it's a lot of noise, restaurants, family gatherings, any situation that you know, it's just gonna to be too much sound. You can go into that manual program and have a front focus with a more aggressive noise reduction algorithm. Now, again, when you have a hearing loss like this individual does, louder is not better for him. And that might be for the same situation for some of you out there. Raising volume and just giving sound is not enough for this gentleman. He needs more help with the technology. And as these hearing aids get exponentially better and more sophisticated and faster processing, you're gonna start seeing a lot of these devices really help in the real world. That AFAB is, is really what's gonna tell us, are you or are you not progressing and doing better than what you did previously? Mm -hmm. um, and what else is there? We have a telecoil as well, as I'm sure you guys could probably school me on the technology itself. That's gonna help out in many situations. And we have a couple areas around Long Beach now that specifically are looped. A lot of our, um, a couple of our, where our veterans live, they have some areas of the center that have loops in it as well with, you know, different types of movie theaters. And I'm sure you guys are aware. And, and, and again, more aggressive microphones. Um, the Roger microphone is one manufacturer's device. There are others. But anytime we have severe hearing loss like this, we know the hearing aids alone aren't going to be enough. Now, we know that as audiologists because we've, we've, we've seen enough of these patients, but that AFAB specifically can really guide us into saying, well, you need more than just the hearing aid. And I don't want to pigeonhole only severe hearing loss. We have plenty of guys, Dr. Ingrau, who have very good hearing on the audiogram, but still suffer and don't thrive with hearing aids for any number of different reasons. Um, but again, that AFAB is going beyond how well you can hear beeps. This is really how well you're doing with your current setup as you are. Correct. So the big question is, we've got this, but did we make this guy's life any better? 
Well, let's take a look. So if we do that same AFAB again, after those changes that Dr. Andreghi mentioned, more frequency lowering and some directional control. Um, there was a question that popped up, what's the difference between directionality and noise reduction? They're really the same. There is a noise reduction that happens in terms of trying to clean up the signal. And then there's also using one of the two microphones more than the other to point and zoom in, so to speak. So directionality is a form of noise reduction and noise reduction is uh, linked in with directionality. But it's really about trying to make the speech in front of you more prominent than the sounds around you. But if we look at this gentleman's AFAB after we did this intervention, then we see over here, the green was the initial and the blue here is after those changes. So if we look at the grid over here, we see that overall before he had difficulty 72.7% of the time. But afterwards, he only reported difficulty 43% of the time. That means that overall, in all listening situations, his average improvement in quality and in the reduction of his effort was 30%. So 30% of the time, he now has less difficulty than he did before. That's really, really important. He's got a lot similar results in background noise, in ease of communication. And when we look at Remember we said he has more difficulty than 95% of people in most situations, but afterwards, even in background noise, he's doing much, much better. He's now around the 50-50 mark. He's not doing great, but he's doing a whole lot better. Now, Dr. Andreghi kind of hedged his bets a little bit in his description. He's correct. Frequency lowering does not always represent a measurable improvement in word understanding, but it often does. In this particular gentleman's case, it gave us almost 20%. So he's doing better objectively by measuring his word understanding, and his day-to-day -day experience has improved. So we're going to kind of wrap up the talking part of this. And I've seen a whole bunch of good questions come in. So we're going to try to handle as many of those. But here's the big take home for you all. Hearing, and you know this, you know this, sometimes I'll just forget this. Hearing loss is a whole lot more than loudness and pitch. And say the word house, right? That's a very, very cursory look at your experience with hearing. So work with your work with your hearing care professional and try to open up a conversation that says, I would like us to look a little bit deeper into my hearing loss. Can we do some additional word testing? I heard about this thing called the AFAB. Now, in the handouts that will be available later on after this talk, there's a blank AFAB. Feel free to complete that before you go see your audiologist. Then they can just score it on their computer and now you have a place to start. The second big thing is that hearing aids and cochlear implants are better at addressing some of these things that we've been talking about. They're getting really good at giving us better tools to help manage your audibility, making it loud enough, your discrimination, making sure the sounds are going in the parts of your ear or your auditory system where you have the best chance of turning that loudness into meaningful speech. And we also have tools to help manage the comfort of your devices. We don't want you turning down the volume because one little sound is too loud. If we can control that sound and leave all that speech where it belongs, okay? If you work together cooperatively with your hearing care professionals, you should be able to improve your quality of life. Now, some people know from my old 
days with H -H, uh, SHHH and HLAA that my uncle was a professional musician and then lost the majority of his hearing and became a hearing aid specialist. And he warned me back then, hearing aids don't make you hear better. They make you hear less bad. Well, to some extent that's still true, but as we've seen with a couple of these tools, hearing aids and cochlear implants can actually make you hear better, but they have to be fitted correctly. And the problem we have had traditionally is we do not have the, the tools to give the level of detail needed to exploit all of these new tools in the hearing devices to help you hear the least bad that you can hear. So I think what we're gonna do is start looking at some questions. Um, and how do you wanna do this, Nancy? Um, I think it might be pretty good, a good idea if I just go through the questions and, um, and just kind of pitch them to you, if that's okay. Okay. Um, there are some really great questions. I'm just going to scroll back. Um, about 817 was where I saw the first qu uh, question come in from Gladys. Okay. And whoops, I'm sorry, I just went right past it. She says, What problem does frequency lowering address? She's a hearing loss patient, not an audiologist. Gotcha. Okay. So when we have hearing loss, we have two problems. One, it's not loud enough to hear. And two, even if it is loud enough to hear, sometimes it's not very clear. So a typical example would be the letter oo or the sound oo, like oo, 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 and the letter e. They are very similar in their construction by pitch and loudness. And if you have certain high frequency hearing loss, they actually get mushed together. So if the part of your ear, the high pitch part of your ear, is responsible to separate out ooh and e, but it's damaged to the point where they're mushing together, frequency lowering can take that information and rather than put it in the part of your ear that is the most damaged, it can move it to a lower pitch area where your ear is actually stronger and in better shape so that you may learn to separate ooh and e again. So what it really addresses is I hear but I don't understand. So that's the primary use and it's, it's for people who have high pitch hearing loss worse than about 60 decibels, so somewhere around 2,000 hertz up to 8,000 hertz, and their word understanding on that sentence, or that word test, say the word law and say the word car, that's lower than about 60%. So if you have poor word understanding and your, your X's and O's on your audiogram for the 2,000 hertz and up, are 60 or worse, frequency lowering may be able to give you more clarity with the loudness. Okay, good answer. It was a good question and she's got a few more, but I'm gonna to try to get to everybody's questions here. Um, is the dedicated fixed program similar to a built-in FM system? Not really. Uh, an FM system really gives us the best what we call signal to noise ratio by taking a remote microphone and putting it extremely close to the person who's talking to you. And then with a wireless connection, we span the distance uh, to your hearing device, which has the receiver for the FM system. A directional, fixed directional program is still on your ear and it's gonna create a more narrow beam of pickup and it will reject some of the sounds to the side and behind you, but not to the extent that you're going to get with an FM system. So with an FM system, it generally makes the speech about 20 decibels louder than the background. And with a directional microphone system, it's about 12 decibels. 
So depending on how much difficulty you have with background noise, a directional microphone program may do it. What we typically will recommend if we have people with very bad AFAB scores, like over 50% for background noise or reverberation, we'll get them the FM system and we'll also give them the directional microphone program. And the way we counsel it is when you walk into a noisy environment, have your microphone, but don't turn it on yet. Let the automatic processing churn away for about 30 seconds. If you're still not understanding the person in front of you, activate your noise reduction or your directional program. Give that 30 seconds. If you're still not understanding, turn on your FM system and hand off the microphone. And then remember, Chili's on a Friday night is always an FM place, <laughs> right? Uh, Starbucks on a Wednesday afternoon might just be a directional microphone program place. Mm -hmm. Brad, are those, uh, the frequency lowering function, is that on every hearing aid or is that something you need to ask your audiologist to install? It's, well, it's available in most of the, what we call the big six. So it's currently available in Phonak hearing aids, all, all Phonak hearing aids, um, most resound hearing aids, most Siemens or Signia hearing aids. Mm -hmm. Widex hearing aids have a version of it that's a little bit different. Starkey hearing aids have it. And um, a couple of Oticon hearing aids, the newer open has some degree of it. So you probably, you have a pretty good chance that it's already in your hearing aid. You just have to have it activated. Um, but you may have an older version that doesn't have it and so something to look at certainly in your next hearing aids even if you don't use it or don't use a lot of it again better to have than not need than the other way around okay and nancy you want to add something to Dave? yeah not, not to interrupt but jay in the q a on the bottom had a good question that i think ties into this he's asking about he has a cochlear implant on one ear but then on the other side, he's confused with frequency lowering, and it's not necessarily turning the high frequencies down. It's more so taking those high frequency information and moving them so that the brain has, it's easier to essentially deal with those high pitches. And these frequency lowering are extremely effective with individuals who essentially don't have those high frequency responses anymore, or like Dr. Ingrau said, we raise the volume in those high pitches, but the ear just doesn't know what to do with the sound. So it's not taking away high frequency because that's where all those S's, T's, F's, and K's are, but more so moving those pitches and changing the sound quality to deliver the signal a little bit easier to digest from the brain. Yep, so a good way to think about frequency lowering is if you have a barbershop quartet, and each of the singers has its own microphone. But then one of the microphones starts to fail and gets very noisy and distorted. If we simply remove it and leave the singer over here, we're not going to get a lot of his information because he's not close enough to a microphone to pick it up. If, however, we take the four singers and we move them a little closer together and move them over to the left, now the four singers are able to activate all three of the good microphones and we get a good quality signal into three microphones, but we don't get any distortion like we had with the broken fourth microphone, but neither do we miss any of that information from the fourth singer, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Russell has asked, what does dedicated noise reduction do? I'm not sure I understand the distinction between that and directionality. Sure, so I kind of addressed this, but uh, once again, it, so noise reduction is a global term. We're trying to get some of the stuff that's not what you want to hear to not be as loud as the stuff that you do want to hear. So one way to do that is with a directional microphone. The directional microphone picks up here and it doesn't pick up to the sides and behind you. That will reduce the noise and give you a better signal to noise ratio. Another way to do that is also to use some things in the hearing aid to identify sounds like a fan or road noise 
and suppress those in the software of the hearing aid. So you get some of that pro, what we call programmatic noise reduction and you add that to directionality and we get sort of the best accentuation of the speech that we want and the de-emphasis of all the other sounds around. Okay, Brenda asks, is frequency lowering on CIs, cochlear implants, the same as decreasing sensitivity? No, and see, and now here's an interesting thing. With, co with cochlear implants, we don't have to do this. We have to do frequency lowering in hearing aids because we are, risk we are still depending on the hair cells of the cochlea to turn the vibration of sound into a nerve impulse. With a cochlear implant, we are going to bypass all of that and we're going to stimulate the auditory nerve with the implant itself. So with, pro with appropriate mapping and assuming that everything is good with the um, uh, electrical system of the implant, we don't need to do this because we can directly stimulate the entire nerve with the implant. Now, if a person has had a very high frequency hearing loss for a long time, the first six or eight months of using the implant, they're going to not have as good a response in that high frequency area and the quality will slowly get to catch up. But we don't use frequency lowering per se. The sensitivity is really more about your microphone. So you can think about the volume is how loud the sound is and the sensitivity is like a circle how wide the pickup is of that loudness. So sensitivity is almost always now automatically set up. So if you're in a noisy environment, the sensitivity will tend to automatically close down to keep that side noise away. But the beauty of cochlear implants is we can actually address the problem of the bad hair cells by bypassing the whole system. Okay. Um just want to remind people that the, the webinar is being uh, recorded and we will have it next week on our website. So uh, if you want to watch it again as many times as you'd like or share it with somebody, uh, you'll be able to do that. Uh, Mark asks, when is a telecoil helpful for someone with a high frequency loss? I apparently have them, but it hasn't been activated. Okay, so I think telecoils are helpful when you are in a situation where there is a loop or there is some signal that will stimulate your telecoil. So the best example I can think of in our area is uh, a couple of auditoriums and some HLAA meetings that we go to and send our veterans to where there's a microphone, like I'm wearing a microphone here, that would be connected to, a mic, to a, uh, an amplifier and a loop amplifier and a room loop that goes around the whole room. If you're in that room and you activate your telecoil, then the primary signal that you will pick up will be whatever's coming into my microphone. And all of the background noise that's not picked up by my microphone will be very low in volume compared to the signal of my voice. And so the reason loops are very, very effective for large areas like houses of worship and meeting halls is we have a good signal at the microphone, we transmit that into the loop environment, and then your telecoil wirelessly grabs that signal out of the loop and brings it right to your hearing device. At the same time, your hearing aid microphones are usually turned down a little bit so that that loop system, that loop input is your real strong signal and everything else is lowered. So if you have telecoils in your hearing devices, and you know that there's a, a loop in your area, and you know that there's a loop in your area by going to the hearingloss.org website and use the loop lookup to find your area, then you can activate that program and you'll be able to hear in that environment. Okay, Lisa asks, are you familiar with the Bose Hearphone? I have expensive resound hearing aids and my loss is now moderately severe. I bought the Bose and it is significantly better than my hearing aids in noisy situations like restaurants, parties, parties with music, etc. My noise reduction setting on my resound hearing aids were not great. Two audiologists where I live were quite impressed with the Bose. 
Um, I'm not familiar with the name of, I, I'm assuming that's their new uh, PSAP, uh, personal sound amplification uh, product. Bose is, is a really great company for high quality sound. And depending on how that's configured, I'm actually not surprised. I don't know necessarily what your hearing loss is or how your resound hearing aids were set. I, I like the fact that your audiologists are open-minded about using other technologies. And I will kind of take uh, a lesson from my good friend, Richard Einhorn. And if you don't know Richard Einhorn, do some research and he's written a lot for HLAA. Whatever works, you know, he uses a variety of technologies. And, you know, if that Bose system works better for you in certain environments, by all means, go for it. Richard Einhorn, by the way, is on um, the HLA Board of Trustees and will be in Minneapolis and I believe he's presenting um, at least one workshop, if not more than that. And he's always uh, very popular. He's, he's great. Um, Patricia says, I am a Baja wearing, um, I have a Baja wearing, com having completely lost my hearing on my left Side, I think she is means to say from a brain tumor. Although my word recommend, recognition is good, I have a problem with understanding words my spouse says. How do I tell my audiology what frequency he has? Well, so there's a couple of ways you can do that. One, uh, you can. So for the people who don't know what a Baja is, it's a bone anchored hearing aid. So when we lose all hearing on one side, but we still have some hearing on the other side we can put a small dental implant into the skull and that attaches to a, a hearing aid device that will pick up sound and then transmit it by vibration through the skull over to the better inner ear. The best way for your audiologist to know what frequency your husband is, is to bring your husband to the audiologist so that the audiologist can measure your husband's voice. The other way you can do it is there's some fairly inexpensive smartphone apps where you can get a frequency response measurement. I don't believe it's probably a frequency issue. I think it's much more about um, maybe where he's standing when he's talking to you um, and, and some programming issues. The Baja is pretty flexible in terms of some of that, but it's not the same as a traditional hearing aid in terms of what we can do with it. So it may just be that potentially you have a little bit of nerve hearing loss as well. And so they may need to remeasure, but bring your husband with you so the audiologist can measure their voice. And then we can actually use your husband as part of the signal to fit the Baja and fine tune the Baja to the husband. <laughs> and again, if, if you don't mind, that's exactly what <clears throat> this whole talk is kind of intended to be apart from the device that you have, cochlear implant, Baja, the Bose headphones, hearing aid. In the booth, we are testing you in a quiet room, but we want you to start thinking real world how well you're doing. The AFAB will be able to identify that, but just like Dr. Ingrao said, start thinking about your environment around you, as I'm sure everyone does. If you're not doing well, recognize what's happening. Is the TV on? Is your husband or significant other not looking right at you? Is there something else going on? Are you having a bad hearing day? You can't pop your ears. There are other factors. And I think that if we can get away from relying on the device to give us what we need versus the device gives a signal, how can we improve our environment? That really can potentially help as well. Okay. Thanks, Lisa, for the clarification on the Bose system. It's an array microphone collar. That's great. So it has multiple microphones, and then that feeds up into headphones. Anytime you have more microphones, you're going to get better separation. So I think, Dave, you and I have to go to the Bose store and, and yeah. pick up one of these and do some testing. Um, there's a question about um, the Nucleus 5. And, oh, I'm going to let Nancy go for it. And we'll okay. Carol writes that, um, you know, we, we advocate that people um, ask their audiologist to do extensive testing and the real ear measurement and so forth. Um, but she's saying that it's sometimes difficult to find an audiologist that does that um, testing and how do you find one. 
And unfortunately, we can't clone Brad and send him all over the place. <laughs> well, you can. His name is Dave Andreggi. He's much younger than I am. He's got more energy um, and uh, more hair. So um, the you're right. You're absolutely right, Carol. You can't make it happen, but you can, I believe, have a frank conversation with your audiologist and say, look, I've been coming here for X number of years. I've bought a lot of hearing aids from you. I like you. Overall, you've done a good job for me. We have gotten to, we've hit a plateau and there are things that I simply cannot do. And I'm not convinced that we have all the data that we need to determine whether I simply can't do them or there's other solutions available to me. So I really need you to either work with me on this or can I just have all my records please and I'm gonna to have to go look for another audiologist. Now, if you're two or three years from your last set of hearing aids and you might be buying new hearing aids, they're probably gonna be a little more willing to work with you. But ultimately this is a consumer issue. You gotta put, you gotta, you gotta vote with your feet sometimes. And unfortunately, it's not this, you know, this stuff, the AFAB was developed in 1995. And we're talking, we're still talking about it today. And we're still teaching audiologists about it today. So it's good. It's an advocacy issue. It's a hard advocacy issue. But um, it's, it's, it's kind of a balance between being a little tough and being nice. But at some point, if they're not willing to work with you, you got to find somebody else. Um, and, and is the real ear test um, providing the same information as the AFAB? No, and that's, see, that's the big thing, is the American Academy of Audiology, the American Speech and Hearing Association, everybody says you should do the real ear test. And I agree, real ear or probe microphone measurements give us audibility. The sound is loud enough to hear, but it doesn't break down. But can you understand it won't tell us if you understand, and it won't tell us if you understand in noise versus quiet versus reverberation. So it's part of the puzzle. It's not, it's the beginning, because if it's not audible, then nothing is going to work. So the probe microphone measurement or the real ear measurement is critical to say there's enough sound there. Then the AFAB, in conjunction with that, says the sound is in the right place, and it's the right pack package of sound, and we're actually addressing the needs. Okay, good. Um, there are so many different brands and models of hearing aids. If, you know, and an audiologist can't offer, you know, six different brands, how does one find the best device for themselves? For themselves? And So technically an audiologist can offer six brands. We do it all, the, all the time at the VA. Um, it's harder. But the typical audiologist yeah. doesn't, right? They won't. They won't. They won't. But they can. But they don't. They, they'll they'll stay with two or three. If you're dealing with major manufacturers like Oticon, Widex, Phonak, GN Resound, uh, Starkey, Siemens, they all have all of the features we talked about. So you're going to get. The, if you're dealing with not proprietary brands but major worldwide manufacturers. You, you can't know for sure exactly what you need until you get in there. But I think, again, as Mark Ross always said, it's not the hearing aid, it's the professional. You have to have a cooperative relationship with your hearing care professional who is going to say, look, I'm, and, and, and I'll give an example of, we have a lot of uh, veterans who are getting close to needing a cochlear implant. And we will, we have six months, we're, we're lucky in the VA, we have six months to return a hearing aid. But we can, within a very short period of time, see a patient, fit them with a hearing aid, do an AFAB, do aided speech testing. Then see them in two weeks and do it again. And if it's not better, we've already ordered them a different hearing aid, we'll change the hearing aid, we'll return the first one, we'll do it again. Two weeks later, we'll do it again. It's not as easy for a, a private practice audiologist but it's possible. Now, if that's not possible for your private practice audiologist, find a university, find a teaching hospital, and there's a little bit more flexibility. But the reality is, is if you measure, if you always measure, our cochlear implant appointments are always the same. You come in, we say hello, we clean your devices, we measure your 
ability to hear sound, and we measure your word understanding before we do anything else, every single appointment. And the reason we do that is because now we have data. We do AFABs periodically throughout the process. And then based on that data, we start to have conversations about the quality of your sound. If your typical interaction with your audiologist is, hey, how does it how does it sound? Well, it's a little bit this, it's a little bit that, but we're never measuring, we're not gonna get anywhere. And I think that goes to the point of how do we find an audiologist? And I'm seeing a couple of the questions. As a consumer, what you can do is the brand, as Dr. Ingrau said, whatever manufactures the six major ones, you're gonna get a good product. These devices are microprocessors. They're fast, they're efficient, they're, they're, they're really impressive, even since I've been doing it. But what we can do as consumers is ask, if you're calling around audiologists, a simple question, what do you do or what are your verification measures? How are you measuring that this hearing aid is doing what it's supposed to do? The probe mic measure, the real ear for many years was the gold standard in a marketing ploy of saying, yes, I measure the hearing aid in the ear and I can verify that it's doing what I want. Now you're starting to see more of these validation measures. Okay, the hearing aid is verified, it's doing what we want, but is it validated? Is it helping me out in the real world? And that's a question I think is a very, you know, I saw something about the dentist. You know, I, I for a dentist, you can see if your if your braces worked or not. You know, you can see if you still if you can feel if you still got a molar or, or a cavity. With your ears, you're right. You're not sure if you're doing the best you can or if you could be doing it better. And that's a valid point. So start doing some of these AFAP or start asking, I need some validation. And I think that that if you have resistance with an audiologist, that potentially could be a red flag and say maybe maybe I, I like you as a person, but there could be other individuals out there who are doing it better. I know the individual I used to work with was really starting to harp on this validation stuff because the probe mic measure should be a gold standard. And then the next step is, what is it doing in the real world? And yeah. I think that can so, separate audiologists pretty easily. Yeah, so so the, the probe mic measurement is the quant quantity of sound and the validation is the quality of sound. So you need both. Uh, one resource that we recommend is Hearing Tracker, and that is a way that um, patients can go in and rate their audiologist so other people can see it, um, see the review. So that might be a good way to find another audiologist if you're still, you know, thinking that you, you need to part ways with your current audiologist. Um, there's so many great questions here, and we are past... Um, nine o'clock. So I'm going to um, have to put an end um, and invite Dr. Uh, Ingrao and Dr. Draghi back to present again, because this is obviously a really popular um, session. Um, one, one question that I can answer pretty quickly was had to do about um, the best practices that audiologists should follow and that is something that we are working with um, ASHA and AAA on all the time because they do have best practices established. It's just a matter of um, them, you know, reinforcing that those practices with their their members. So uh, it takes a village. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, I see that there's just so many questions here and it's great, but um, just a reminder that we will post the recording of this webinar on our website, hopefully by next week. And you'll be able to see that uh, if you go to the online community webinar section, there's a replay um, section and you'll see it there along with um, the PowerPoint uh, as a PDF and um, the handouts as well. So thank you so much. And anytime you'd like to, to come back for an, another presentation, we would welcome you to do that. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And we'll see you next month. Thank you. Okay. Our pleasure. Thanks very much for having us. All right. Great thank questions, you. everybody. All righty. Bye-bye.